are um, informal institutions that create weak social ties that are very inexpensive to create and maintain. And for a lot of reasons, for all of those reasons actually, um, caucuses for a long time in, in the literature and in you know, sort of common talk in Washington, um, they're dismissed, they're trivial. You know, oh, the bike caucus, oh, the autism caucus, oh, the Parkinson's caucus, funny, okay, great. Um, you know, there's a beer wholesaler's caucus too. Well, the fact that they are social things and maybe sometimes trivial things and that they create these weak ties between people. Uh, we know that the, the members of Congress themselves rarely go to these things if they have events at all. It's usually the staffers, the you know, 20 year old interns that go. Um, but that, in our view, is their beauty. That's their value because they're creating weak ties. Those weak ties have the opportunity to create uh, a structure and a bridge that can't exist through the formal institutions. All right, I'm actually gonna skip the picture of the hypothetical LMO network because I think it's hard to read and I'm not sure it adds much here. Um, okay, so all I've done really so far is talk about the book, so I'm getting to the good stuff here. Um, so the, the point of the book is that uh, caucuses help to establish uh, and maintain relationships that members would not otherwise have. Uh, they are ch caucuses are cheap, they provide information, and they allow members to be less constrained in who they wind up interacting with. Okay, so if it is the case that there is an informal, uh, not totally informal, but somewhat in, le more informal than parties and committees, institution within Congress that can create these types of bridging ties, it sounds to me like something that might have the opportunity to offset polarization, because polarization is all about being in your camps. Um, and so we go in with this observation, looking at the caucus data, that uh, caucuses are in fact bipartisan, most of them, almost all of them actually, uh, to some extent, and they have proliferated. Um, and legislators may seek, on occasion, countervailing information. They have incentives to seek countervailing information because if they all live in a bubble, then they don't, uh, uh, they don't get any perspective on the other side and it uh, makes it harder to vote on things. So the presence of a voluntary bipartisan institution could provide a low-cost source of countervailing information that could be very productive in the legislative process and negotiating on bills and so forth. All right, we all know Congress is polarized. I'm just going to skip that one. Um, uh, so this was, I don't know if this is all that necessary right now either, but anyway, House productivity, uh, so this is the number of bills that have been introduced in Congress have uh, gone up in time, the percent that have been passed into law has gone up, down over time, uh, this isn't the, you know, number of bills passed is probably not the best me measure of House productivity and I should get the legislative effectiveness summary statistics in here. Um, but in any case, the idea is that polarization has contributed to some dysfunction in Congress and some inability to get things done. Okay, so the book project included data from three Congresses, the 109th, 110th, and 111th. So for those of you that don't speak Congress, that's uh, 2000, oh, do I still speak Congress? Uh, nine, uh, seven to 2012. Ish. I got that a little bit wrong. Um, but we have caucus data now from the 103rd, which is 1994, to the 112th, 2012. Um, and I have RAs right now working on collecting the data from the 113th. Um, and as Samara has already mentioned, collecting this data is a really non trivial task. <laughs> Um, there's no good systematic way to do it. Uh, they, and what we discovered in our research is that there is a list, so you can go onto the House website and find the list of the formal caucuses that exist. Um, turns out that's only about half of the ones that actually exist, and there are hundreds of caucuses that exist that don't register because there's no consequence to not registering. Um, and so, and, and they don't have to, as Samara explained, they don't have to produce uh, or publish membership lists. So the method that we use to collect these data um, is uh, there's a publisher in DC uh, called the Congressional Yellow Book. And essentially, they're a quarterly phone book. Um, and what they do is they send a survey to every office on the Hill every quarter saying, you know, what committees are you on and what, you know, basic biographical information about the office and the member and what caucuses you're in and what leadership positions you have and so on and so forth. And it's a phone book. Um, but in the phone book, you get every single member of Congress and which caucuses they're in. And so we go through that phone book one by one, member by member, and record all those caucuses so that we wind up with a bimodal matrix of members and caucuses. So we're, we're inferring, we're sort of backing out the caucus membership by going through uh, individually by member, uh, which is a, a painful and somewhat error-prone process. 
Um, but what we can see is that caucuses really have proliferated uh, through the 1990s, and there's some interesting historical changes that occur uh, in the early 90s that I'll skip for now. If you want to ask about it later, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, so the red lines are Republican uh, majority houses, and the blue lines are Democratic majority houses. So the proliferation of caucus caucuses has nothing to do with which party is in control of Congress. Um, the average size of these caucuses have been going up over time, um, and the number of them, uh, 112, has nearly five, had nearly 500 caucuses. Um, and so I, and I expect the 113th is, is going to be on, on, the, on the same trend. Um, and we observe bipartisanship in this caucus population. So uh, this is the proportion, so this line here is the proportion of caucuses that are bipartisan. So these are caucuses that have both Republican and Democratic members. Now, many of these, as Samar has already noted, are imbalanced. There may be 80% Republicans, or 80% Democrats and 20% Republicans. We know that the Democrats are joiners. They just join stuff. They join more caucuses. They, they I can't explain why exactly. It must have something to do with the Boy Scouts. Um, but the Democrats are joiners. And uh, so there, it's, it's definitely more Democratic heavy. Um, and Democratic Party uh, partisanship does uh, predict caucus membership. Um, but most caucuses are, are not only bipartisan, but they value their bipartisanship. We, we spoke to a number of caucuses on the Hill that would tell us things like, oh yeah, we were a caucus last year, but we haven't re-registered yet this year because one of our co-chairs, they often have a Democratic and Republican co-chair, one of our co-chairs had to leave for some reason and we don't want to re-register again until we have both parties represented in the caucus leadership. They value that bipartisanship so much, they try to stay out of, non uh, out of controversy um, because the caucus is this place for information exchange and, and relationships. Okay, so getting a little bit more into the idea of bipartisanship here, um, the ratio of Democrats to Republicans, uh, and I didn't get the 112th data in here, so we've just got 1994 to 2010 here. Um, what we get is that, so the, the, fifth, the, the ratio, if, if every caucus was exactly half Republican and half Democrat, then it would all be at this one, this darker one line here, at a perfect one ratio. Um, and we can see across time that uh, we are getting more Democratic heavy as we get into, and again, this is sort of seems to be regardless of which party is in majority. Um, so somehow caucus participation has nothing to do with who's in charge. Um, and so we still do see Democratic uh, leanings um, in the bipartisan uh, makeup of these groups, um, but there's still a lot of parties in, in, in most groups, in both groups. Um, that this graph is the same as the previous, except this is weighted by size of the group. So not just numbers of uh, Republicans to Democrats, not just the ratio, but then multiply that ratio by the total size of the caucus. So the fact that this jumps up so much here, the 70th percentile gets this spike here, tells me that the largest caucuses are really Democratic heavy. So we're talking about the Fire Services Caucus and the Diabetes Caucus and the Parkinson's Caucus. Um, those really, really big groups that have, you know, three, four hundred, well, they don't have four hundred, but they have two, three hundred members um, are, are majority Democrat. Okay. So hypotheses. Uh, legislators more connected by caucuses are more likely to vote the same way, all else being equal. Now, if we're going to look at voting as a dependent variable, we already know that we can explain 95% of the variance by just looking at party. So we're already talking about looking for something on the margins here. Um, but the idea is, if caucuses really are providing this opportunity for novel information exchange and novel relationships, um, then it, su it suggests that we should see evidence of that in the voting record, perhaps. Maybe we're looking in the wrong place, but this is, you know, you go with the, the data you've got sometimes. Um, hypothesis two is that same party legislators will be more connected by caucuses, uh, will be more likely to vote the same way. So in much the same expectation as the previous pa paper, uh, we do certainly expect to see that if you're from the same party, we're gonna see a much stronger effect here. Um, and then we hypothesize that opposite party legislators uh, more connected by caucuses would be more likely to vote the same way, or the alternative hypothesis is that they would not be. Okay, so we've got a mass of data here. We have every roll call between 1993 and 2010. Um, we probably should cull that a little bit, and I have some ideas about how to do that. Uh, that'll be my Paul Net paper. Um, and then we calculate a co-voting matrix on all of those roll calls. So you take however many thousands of roll calls they took in each Congress, um, and for each dyad, for each pair of legislators, you calculate the percentage of time that you both voted the same way given that you both cast a vote. Uh, so we call that co-voting. 
and uh, then the covariates, so that's our dependent variable, and the covariates is a bunch of usual suspects. So the key independent variable of interest here is caucus participation, uh, which we will interact with party. And then everything else that we think, we, you know, sort of kitchen sink approach to what else explains voting. Um, trying to make sure we're controlling for as much as we, we think we can. Everything from uh, how much you won your last election by to how much you co-sponsor co -sponsor, uh, and so forth. Um, a little bit more about co-voting. I think I'm going long, so I'm gonna skip that. The distribution of co-voting, as you might expect, is bimodal. Uh, that's what it looks like. Um, the empirical model is, uh, we're going to use a panel corrected standard error fixed effects model. Uh, so this is our attempt to take our continuous dependent variable uh, that we do log and, uh, and model it based on knowing that there is going to be a lot of autocorrelation in this data um, and using the panel corrected standard errors and fixed effects to try to control for that uh, autocorrelation. Uh, which we think does a decent job. It may not be the, the best, uh, but get, given the dependent variable, I, I think it's doing okay. Um, so you can't really read this very well, uh, which I don't know why any of us ever do this, but here I'm gonna talk about it anyway. So the thing to look at here is this is the number of common caucuses. Uh, so we estimate one model uh, without an interaction term and we see the number of common caucuses positively and statistically significantly predicts co-voting. When we interact that number of common caucuses with being in the same party, so dyads of the same party, um, then we get an interesting finding. The uh, coefficient on number of common caucuses becomes negative, and the uh, interaction term is positive and significant. So for some interpretation of that, we find that one additional common caucus is associated with two additional votes uh, in agreement across a thousand vote Congress. So again, we're talking about small effects. These are, these are definitely small effects on the margins. Uh, you could restate that as four additional common caucuses is associated with about a 1% higher co-voting rate. Uh, so not a lot, maybe not enough to matter. It's hard to, you know, that's, I guess, in the eye of the beholder. Um, but then looking at the interaction term, we get not exactly what we thought we were gonna get. Looking at opposite party pairs, one additional common caucus is associated with seven fewer votes in agreement across a thousand vote Congress. Um, so opposite party pairs who are in more caucuses together vote together less often than they would if they weren't in caucuses together. So that was the part that we didn't expect. Um, it doesn't quite fit exactly with our, our theoretical expectation. Um, on the same party pairs, you get exactly what you would expect and being in more caucuses, um, all else being equal does make you vote together a little bit more often. Okay, so some grains of salt. Uh, we may still have some autocorrelation issues that we need to handle. Uh, we're thinking some permutation tests, I think, are in order here. Um, not sure we've totally leveraged the dynamic and longitudinal aspect of this massive data set that we have that has more than 800,000 observations in it. Um, and we're looking at really small effect size. So when you've got an N of over 800,000 and a final substantive effect that's, you know, uh, in the 1, 2% range, um, you know, you, you have to be thinking of things with lots of grains of salt. Okay, so voluntary institutions do solve an information-based collective action problem that parties and committees don't solve. Uh, so caucuses are an important indirect process uh, in lawmaking. Um, and they do provide a venue for building relationships and information because they are cheap and flexible and unconstrained by the formal institutions. Uh, so we do see this cross-cuttingness. Uh, but we don't, I, I thought I had one more slide on the more uh, relevant stuff in the paper, but we don't exactly see that come through in the uh, same and opposite party pairs uh, looking at the co-voting. So happy for your, your thoughts and feedback.